Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the five-part series, Being uh, Black and Disabled. Uh, my name is Tamika Citrus Bruce, and I am a disability justice activist and um, filmmaker, uh, a Detroit native, and I'm also the lead um, Black Initiatives Coordinator for the uh, Great Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. And so, uh, again, welcome to uh, Be a Black and Disabled. Uh, so I really created this uh, series because uh, oftentimes there's not many spaces, you know, not enough like talks about uh, the, the, the challenges, you know, the struggles, but then also the, the, the joys and the beauty, you know, that comes with uh, being Black and disabled. So um, the first part of the series uh, today, the webinar is um, Black and Living with Chronic Illness. Um, and then in July will be uh, Black and uh, Living with Mental Illness. And then it would be uh, Black in um, Autism, Autistic, and then Black in Dyslexic. So I have many great different uh, speakers, uh, people who will be um, coming to speak about their experiences and the challenges and all that of being uh, Black with their respective um, condition. So I'm happy here uh, to have um, Hubert Alexander. Um, he, you know, he's a great person and uh, he's living with sickle cell, so he's anemia, which affects uh, many uh, people in the African American community. So um, I know I really uh, wanted to, you know, focus on um, sickle cell anemia since, like I said, it affects many of us. So um, I'm going to give uh, Herbert the floor to, um, you know, describe yourself, give us a little bit of background information about who he is, and we'll get right into uh, the discussion. So, welcome, Herbert. Uh, hello, Tamika. Thank you for having me. Um, my name's Hubert Alexander. I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. I uh, moved to the Lansing area in my early 20s. Um, since then, I've gotten married, have three kids, um, one adult child, about two minor children. Um, I currently work as a uh, departmental analyst uh, for the state of Michigan. And as like the topic um, that you introduced, uh, I live and deal with the effects of uh, having sickle cell anemia. Yes, welcome. So if you can tell us what is sickle cell anemia? So what sickle cell anemia is, is um, it's a genetic condition in which um, a person's body doesn't produce a round red blood cell like a um, normal uh, individual would. Um, the blood cells that are produced by people with sickle cell um, have a crescent, some of them have a crescent moon shape, uh, hence the name uh, sickle uh, comes from. And then what happens with that is if enough of those um, sickle shaped uh, blood cells uh, connect to one another, it actually creates a blockage in the body, um, which causes uh, severe amount of pain. And if the blockage is severe enough, it can actually um, end up destroying internal organs and tissues in the body. Um, it also makes it sense sickle cell, sickled blood cells are unable to carry a oxygen hemoglobin. Um, sometimes you feel like a shortness of breath um, uh, when you're going through a sickle cell crisis. Thank you for letting us know uh, what that what that is. So if you can, you know, describe uh, what age you were 
when you were first diagnosed with sickle cell and you know then tell us uh, some of the experiences that you had during childhood. Uh well growing up I was a sickly child. Um when my mother would take me to the doctor, um from what I can remember, it would be uh, comments such as, um, I pulled a back muscle or, <clears throat> excuse me, or uh, at one point, my mother was told that my intestines were growing faster than the rest of my body. Um, and so treatment for me was um, being sent home, given a hot water bottle or, uh, a heat pad and the Tylenol, something like that. Uh, when I was just getting ready to go into high school, uh, between ninth and 10th grade, um, one physician that uh, my mother took me to diagnosed me as uh, having sickle cell. Being a teenager, I had no idea what that was. Um, I do vaguely remember him stating that most people with sickle cell um, don't live past their 30s. I mean, in all honesty, uh, I guess it traumatized me to the point that I just, I literally like mentally blocked it. <clears throat> so as I uh, continued uh, to age, I would have episodes not realizing that I was having a sickle cell episode um, and then it was when I was in my late 20s um, that I was actually hospitalized for a little over two weeks. And the uh, doctors, once I was admitted, um, didn't know um, what was going on with me. Uh, I had called the uh, paramedics. Uh, I was getting ready for work and suddenly I couldn't breathe. And so when the paramedics arrived, uh, they took my uh, oxygen meter um, and I was almost, I was in the single digits for uh, blood oxygen level. Um, so I spent, like I said, a little over two weeks in the hospital. And that was when I really actually started being treated for my sickle cell. Yeah, that, I, I see. And I know that um, sickle cell is uh, hereditary, you know? So um, um, I presume that family, um, you know, that had sickle cell, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in order for uh, a child uh, to have sickle cell, um, there, there's two different distinctions of sickle cell anemia. Um, in order for a child to have full sickle cell anemia, um, they have to have, both parents had to have either had sickle cell or been a carrier of the sickle cell trait. If one parent is a carrier of the trait, um, then what can happen is the child may carry a sickle cell trait, but not, um, necessarily be subjected to um, the same issues that somebody that has two sickle cell traits um, in, their, in their family would be subjected to. Um, I have uh, apparently one sickle cell trait and then, uh, which is why, um, as the doctors have now described to me that um, I'm not in the hospital, um, necessarily as much. Um, my episodes of sickle cell crisis, I can usually manage at home. Um, and uh, I have a, another hereditary, hereditary blood disorder um, called beta thalassemia, which is another um, type of anemic-like uh, blood disorder. And apparently those two traits are what attribute to my milder form of sickle cell episodes versus what um, people that have uh, two traits of sickle cell episode or sickle cell anemia have. So normally um, I'm hospitalized maybe once 
a year, um, probably about once every three years, I find myself hospitalized uh, for my sickle cell anemia. And then usually when someone is uh, hospitalized, there isn't a cure for sickle cell. Um, what, the, what the medical professionals will usually do is try to keep, um, try to keep the person hydrated and then on some form of pain management until those um, sickled cells are ultimately flushed through um, the, the, your body and then your body starts uh, replenishing those um, destroyed blood cells. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And then, you know, listening to you and you know, as you discussed that, um, you know, you was first diagnosed as a teenager and then you know, it, it, scared, it scared you to death pretty much that, you know, that they said, the doctor said you won't live past, you know, your 30s. And I know when we were discussing, you know, um, uh, you know, as we were talking yesterday, that you said that your grandfather probably had sickle cell, but nobody really knew what that was. Am I, am I correct? Yeah, per what you yeah. Said? Um, my grandfather on my mother's side of the family, um, he was from uh, the Old South. Um, and uh, back then, um, it wasn't uncommon for um, African-American people to not even have documentation of a live birth. So um, there were no medical records related to his condition. I just recently found out myself that growing up, he was a sickly child and that um, at some point in his life, he found out that he didn't have a spleen. Um, which leads me to believe that he may, I believe that he had sickle cell because one of the things that is common for people with sickle cell is to not have a functioning spleen. Um, usually the spleen is damaged um, over the course of repeated sickle cell crises. So um, my aunts were telling me that um, they, what did they call it? The, uh, the pains. Apparently, that's what um, his generation called it. It was just the pains. So, yeah, he. I believe I definitely. I believe I got a, a trait. Um, one of the sickle cell traits came from my mother's side of the family, um, and then where the beta thalassemia trait came from, I have no idea. But like I said, I'm. Um, it is a struggle, um, but I am uh, thankful that um, as I've come into contact with uh, people that have uh, other family members that have sickle cell, um, that um, I, I've been able to make it into my 50s um, and have a family and maintain employment um, while dealing with, uh, you know, this, I guess I'd call it a hidden disability because you know, somebody with sickle cell, you can't necessarily look at them and realize that that they have that condition. Yeah, yeah that, that's definitely, uh, definitely true. You know, it is a, a invisible hidden disability. And I know that just based on, you know, my research and understanding, uh, you know, things that show up in the African-American community in particular, that, you know, we're the latest to get diagnosed and, and so you know it's either relate to diagnosis or you know uh, especially in the past you know it's like we don't really want to you know identify or take on that condition or that disability you know so we have make up other names or, you know say just it's, it's it's interesting you know how it show how we, you know, deal with it um, as a black community. But as you said, you know, as you run into, you know, more people with such a cell and such, you know, and the more awareness that we have about the condition and, and everything and, and we can, you know, live longer and know how to treat it better and such. So um, if you can tell me, like, it starts with, you know, your adults and your different episodes, um, did you receive stigma uh, or, or challenges from the medical you know, community, like your doctors, 
are such when it came to your condition? Um, it's uh, one thing I have learned um, since dealing with sickle cell as an adult is um, you, you really have to advocate uh, for yourself uh, sometimes when dealing with the medical uh, community. Um, <clears throat> uh, much to the angst of my wife, um, when I have an episode, I probably uh, should go to the hospital more than I do. Um, but historically, I shy away from um, going to the hospital when I have a sickle cell crisis, because I, in addition to dealing with the pain of the crisis, um, you know, it's, it's difficult when you go into the emergency room and you basically have to prove that you're not there just trying to get some um, hospital grade painkillers um, to satisfy some type of addiction. Um, almost every time that I've been to the hospital dealing with a sickle cell episode um, as an adult, that's, that's pretty much been the case. Um, and, and then once it's determined that yes, I am in there um, having a sickle cell crisis, then it's almost a, a 180. Usually if I'm in there with a sickle cell crisis, I get admitted to the hospital. Once I'm admitted to the hospital, then at that point it goes from me advocating to try and get some form of pain relief to help me get through this crisis to then me trying to um, regulate the pain medication. Because one of the last things I wanna do when dealing with a sickle cell episode is pick up uh, a narcotics addiction trying to make it through the episode. So usually in the hospital, um, I usually uh, don't take, or I usually don't accept the, the full amount of um, pain medication that they may prescribe. I usually just try to make sure that I, that I get enough to take the edge off the pain, because like I said, one of the things that, that I've always been, um, afraid about and concerned about is the stigma of going for medical treatment for a condition and then coming out with some form of addiction. Um, I've known many of people that have had back injuries, surgeries, things like that, that ultimately get um, hooked on pain medication. And I just have always been extra cautious because I just didn't didn't want that extra burden in addition to the stigma of uh, being an African-American with a um, narcotic um, painkiller um, uh, addiction. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand that. And I know we were, you know, that we were, you know, talking yesterday too, that, um, that you have to Prove if like you mentioned it just now, but you have to prove every time you go to the doctor that you got sickle cell anemia. I'm like, wow, so you got every time you got to prove that, even when you know there's medical records, and, you know, say electronic, you have to prove that you have sickle cell. That you're not just there, you know, for um, trying to you know, get pain medication. So talk a little bit about that. that yeah, it. It's definitely been uh, challenging. Like I said, every 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 time I have gone to the hospital um, in a in a sickle cell crisis, um, it's been a matter of of me having to prove that I have this issue. Versus, and nowadays medical records are um, at least at the hospital I go to, they're they're computerized. So in the time that it takes for somebody to basically, and I go to the same hospital, um, to just access my records and, and verify that, yes, I have a, a sickle cell condition, um, I'm usually, um, while I'm waiting, they may administer morphine. Um, and, you know, people, 
people with different medical conditions react different ways to painkillers. Um, morphine doesn't take the edge off of a sickle cell episode for me. It makes me nauseous. And then they want to give me something for the nausea and then give me another shot of morphine when I tell them that it's not doing anything for the pain. Um, once either my blood work has come back or my urine sample has come back, um, then that's when they'll come in and actually uh, issue me something. Uh, I can't remember the names, but they'll actually issue me something um, stronger that then usually takes the edge off of the pain. And by that point, I've been fighting this episode for probably on average seven, eight hours, and I'm just exhausted. Um, and once it's confirmed that I do have that condition and then I get sufficient pain medication, then I'm actually um, able to get some rest, go to sleep, and then usually I'm admitted to the hospital. Wow, yeah, that's that's just amazing. And I know, you know, people that's you know watch it today is like, wow, you have to actually prove that's 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 amazing. And I know uh you said that one doctor in particular said that you didn't look like you had sickle cell. Yeah, it's um it it's pretty much every time every time I've been admitted the last maybe ten years, um uh, every single doctor has said that I don't look like a typical sickle cell patient. Now, I don't necessarily know what that means. I don't know if it's because the, the la actually the last time I was in the hospital, a little over a year ago, um, the hospital now has a floor uh, specified for um, people that have sickle cell. And every just about every nurse and every doctor that came in um, made comment that they pretty much know who all their sickle cell people are because um, it's not uncommon for somebody with sickle cell to be in the hospital once a month, once every couple of months or something like that. And none of them had seen me before. So it's, like I said, I've, I've heard that comment. I've heard um, I must have a high uh, pain tolerance uh, because of sickle cell. Um, no, I, I don't have a high pain tolerance. I've had to learn how to suffer without pain medication being available. Um, that's not tolerance. That's I didn't have a choice. So, um, you know, it's a, it's amazing what uh, you, you can get through when you have to, um, but it's definitely there's definitely a stigma when you're, um, I think, African-American dealing with a disability that causes some type of pain and discomfort um, of getting treated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true in that, you know, I know it's in the medical community, there's a thing that, you know, African-Americans can tolerate more pain, you know, and, and things like that. So it's very, very um, unfortunate that you, you know, you and many other people um, who have, you know, uh, disabilities, like, and especially, you know, hidden, uh, that you have to go through. They have to prove it. You got to go to the Spain. And you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's very unfortunate. Um, and so if anybody has questions uh, for please uh, put them on the comment on the uh, Facebook and I'll get to them around the seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time um, hour. Um, so, you know, we talked about the medical, medical community of doctors and such. So can you tell me any um, stigmas that you've experienced in your professional or your uh, personal life and, and, you know, how do you navigate that? Um, well, being that sickle cell isn't a, a visible, necessarily a visible disability, um, I haven't necessarily had to uh, navigate that area as much um, on a professional level. Um, every job that I've had 
um, by the time um, I've fought to make sure that I build up enough sick time um, in order to deal with a sickle cell uh, crisis when they when they occur. Um, you know, like like any just about any disability, you it's your body. You you know the signs of um, when your affliction is about to rear its ugly head. Um, you know approximately how long uh, it it's going to take. Um, for you to recover or bounce back, um, it, at least for me anyway. Um, I know that a sickle cell episode that doesn't require me to be hospitalized is normally going to, I'm going to be pretty much laid up for about three days and then maybe another four or five days after that. Um, I'm going to be a little slow moving and whatnot. Um, if I end up being hospitalized, uh, usually, obviously, my recovery time, um, as far as me being mobile, um, is a little bit longer. But I've been fortunate that professionally, um, when I've had a sickle cell episode, I've had the um, sick time available or vacation time. I've had some type of personal time available in order to be able to um, use that. And when I had, uh, when I was younger and had a more physically um, demanding job. Um, my employer at the time was was pretty under my supervisor was pretty understanding um, about my condition when I would call in. I mean, this was before they had Family Medical Leave Act. So, like I said, I've been very fortunate in that matter. Um, same way with my my uh, personal life. Um, I've been very fortunate that my wife, um, when we were dating. Um, she was with me on several occasions um, early on when we were dating, in which I had um, a sickle cell episodes, and I would go on to explain uh, to her like what that entailed. She did some research on her own to get familiar with it, um, and uh, she's been a real advocate too for um, me making trying to make sure that I'm taking care of of myself and advocating for myself uh, when I do have to go to the doctor, I do have to seek some form of, of medical treatment. So um, I've been pretty blessed on both of those fronts. Um, so I can't really, can't really complain in, in those two areas. Um, she's been very supportive every time I've been in, we're obviously married now. She's been very supportive every time I've been um, in the hospital. Um, she asks questions to make sure that she understands what's going on. Um, she may challenge the, the medical professionals um, at times on my behalf. <clears throat> um, so it's been, uh, it, it, it definitely could be, have been a lot worse. But like I said, I've, I've been blessed in the fact that um, I've been able to navigate dealing with sickle cell both uh, professionally and, and personally. Yeah, that's 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 uh, you know, great, great to know. And so I know you know, you've definitely, as you have beautifully stated, that you been blessed. But I know some people uh, with you know a hidden condition, uh, disability, that they have fear, you know, when it comes to uh, a job. And so, like, do you disclose or have you disclosed? to your employers uh, that you have sickle cell or have you ever been, had like thoughts like, oh no, I don't want to be outed or what if I have a sickle cell attack in the office and you know, say so like, how would people react to me? Have you had like, how do you deal with those type of emotions? Well, um, during a, a job interview process, no, that's not, that's not information that uh, I would openly disclose. Um, and part of that is for the same reason why, uh, and this is just my opinion, why um, a pregnant female may not necessarily disclose during a job interview that, that she's pregnant. You know, you don't want to deal, uh, um, the job interview process is stressful enough as it is. You know, you're trying to put your best foot forward. Um, and especially people that don't understand uh, what sickle cell is, that's not information that 
during a job interview, um, I would just normally volunteer. Um, you know, once, you know, as I've been employed by uh, several different uh, companies throughout my career, you know, yes, it, it does come up. Um, when I have um, a crisis, I'll usually, um, the first time I have a crisis, I'll usually um, let my manager, my supervisor know what's going on. Um, and then at some point, I just try to explain um, what it is once I, you know, once I return to work, because the, the uh, question always arises, well, I've never heard of that. What is that? Um, and then when you try to explain it, when you, when you try to explain it in a way uh, to somebody who doesn't deal with it and then put it into terms that make it relatable, um, sometimes that can be challenging. Um, for me, when people to ask me, you know, what is, what's sickle cell, um, what it's like, you know, I, I just generally try to tell people, you know, are you familiar with how a stroke operates? You know, a stroke is a blood clot that blocks flow of blood to the brain. And I said, so a sickle cell episode is your blood's not clotting, but your red blood cells are blocking flow to some portion of your body, which creates an intense amount of pain, you know, and can just like um, the brain cells die during a stroke, um, parts of your brain or parts of your, your body um, or organs can be permanently severely damaged during a sickle cell episode. Uh, usually when I explain it in, in that manner, um, they have a better grasp um, as to what I'm dealing with or what I'm talking about. And then uh, every once in a while you get somebody that um, is really curious about it. And then from that conversation, they actually go online to the internet or something and do some research on their own um, uh, to find out about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely get that. It's like that's not something you want to volunteer. Like on the first day, hey, I got sickle cell. Like okay, you know what I'm saying? So I can understand. I can understand, understand uh, of that. And as far as with you know, since it is, um, as I stated in the beginning, that is a hereditary uh, condition. Um, you know, what about have you had fears about or uh, thoughts about passing it on to your children you know how did that how does that thinking process goes and you know talking about that with your wife and you when you were uh, ready to have children <clears throat> well my um growing up as i well when i was uh became an adult um my oldest child was born a few years before I was uh, hospitalized in my 20s. So, um, and like I said, having um, basically suppressed, you know, the, the information of um, being diagnosed in my teens with sickle cell, uh, when my oldest son um, was born, or was conceived, that wasn't uh, something that I actually had on my mind. Um, once I was diagnosed, once I was re-diagnosed um, as an adult, um, that was obviously something that was a concern of mine. Uh, he was tested um, for sickle cell, uh, for sickle cell trait, and uh, that came back uh, negative, but my understanding now is that um, African-American children or biracial children um, are now automatically tested. And I don't know if that's 100% true, but that's just information that was passed along to me in the hospital because my two younger kids, um, all three of my kids are biracial. Um, and that was a concern of whether or not uh, they would be carriers. Um, when they were born, apparently they were automatically tested for the sickle cell trait, and neither one of them, neither one of my younger two children had the sickle cell trait either. So 
I mean, it's definitely something that I was concerned with um, because if uh, a person with sickle cell trait has a child with another person with a sickle cell trait, there's like a one in four chance of that child um, having full sickle cell anemia. Um, and uh, even though my uh, sickle cell episodes are considered to be on the um, less severe side, uh, I definitely wouldn't wish that disability on, on my worst enemy. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, you know, that's, that's something I didn't know that till you told me that, you know, black, uh, black children are automatically, um, you know, tested for a sickle cell, you know, treat in the beginning. And, and why is that, you know, in fact, uh, predominantly the black community? And I know you said it also predominantly affect the uh, um, Middle Eastern community as well. Right. Uh, the, well, I'm no, let me just throw out that disclaimer that I'm no doctor or uh, a geneticist. Um, but my understanding is that uh, uh, people with sickle cell, the <clears throat> it's a, a genetic condition that generally affects people from African-American and Mediterranean descent. Um, people with sickle cell uh, are supposedly immune from malaria. So um, malaria is carried by mosquitoes in um, hot, moist, tropical climates. So I don't know if it's a uh, um, evolutionary thing to combat um, malaria in those areas. Uh, I don't know. Um, Medically, I can't, I can't answer that uh, as any type of expert. I just know that from what I've read. Uh, uh, the one good thing that's come from having sickle cells, apparently I'm immune from contracting malaria. Um, not that I would ever be in sub-Sahara, moist, damp <laughs> continent, but, um, you know, who, who knows? But normally, um, I, I think that you know, most of these diseases have some type of origin uh, of some sort, some type of um, body's mechanism of dealing with something. So, um, yeah, but hopefully that answered your question. And that's what I, when I looked it up um, a little while back, uh, that's what it did say about protection from malaria. But it is important to note that, you know, white people, you know, and others can have sickle cell as well, uh, but it does tend to, you know, predominantly affect um, African American communities. So, so with that being said, um, as far as with, you know, policies um, is concerned, you know, living to, you know, 50, years old with sickle cell, are there any policies that you see um, that is, you know, that, that needs to be done or needs to be fixed or, you know, when it comes to people living with sickle cell? Um, I, I definitely see more of a, growing up, I never heard anything medically, in the medical field about sickle cell. Um, within the last few years, um, I've heard stories of um, experimental treatment um, of potentially curing sickle cell through bone marrow transplant. Um, I, I know that uh, just from reading that more research appears to be being done on um, sickle cell disease. I don't know if that's because um, the African American population is growing. Um, you know, we have um, more mixed race uh, people out there that, although they may not have sickle cell disease, maybe it, you know may still carry the trait. Um, I definitely would like to see more awareness brought to uh, what sickle cell is and how it affects people. Um, you know. Two of the things that you brought up early on um, in the interview is um, dealing with the stigma of 
having a disability um, and receiving adequate medical treatment. Um, it's, it's very difficult dealing with a disability when people say, will, will say, well, you, you look fine. You know, you don't look like you're sick. Um, you know, it, it's more, it'd be nice if, if more awareness was brought to the fact that somebody dealing with a chronic condition doesn't always wear a sign or, you know, something that designates that they have a chronic condition, you know, <clears throat> you know because I can walk, um, because I can, you know, uh, I'm not in a wheelchair or on crutches or anything like that. It doesn't mean that I'm not dealing with a condition. It just means that my condition is not one that's not openly visible. Um, so I it would definitely be nice um, if one uh, access to health care <clears throat> was made, um, if there were policies that allowed uh, people more easily access to health care. I mean, the Affordable Care Act obviously has um, given people access that were previously unable to receive medical treatment um, <clears throat> because technically um, uh, an insurer could deny me medical coverage because my sickle cell anemia is a pre-existing condition. Um, so I'm thankful for uh, that legislation. Um, I would like to see legislation that allowed people more access uh, to treatment. Um, and I would definitely like to see uh, more training in the medical field to destigmatize when minorities go in for, or anybody for that matter, when they go in for medical treatment for some type of chronic chronic condition. Um, you know, nobody wants to go to the hospital. I know I don't want to go to the hospital because um, I, you know, because I ain't got nothing better to do, but you know, nobody definitely wants to go into the emergency room and have to explain a dozen times what's wrong when with today's technology, you literally can go to a terminal, enter the patient's information and see that, okay, this individual is suffering from sickle cell anemia. Um, and now that a lot of the uh, medical practitioners are even tracking when uh, narcotic, when opioid-based drugs, uh, painkillers are prescribed, th they can even see the last time you had a a refill or the last time that you were even treated. But even then, uh, as we were talking earlier, um, I just met with uh, my medical professional a week ago and requested a refill of um, my uh, painkillers because the ones that I had are little over a year old, and they generally tell you to pitch them. So I went into the doctor's office with my bottle of, of remaining painkillers, asked for a refill prescription that was a lower pill count than the original prescription, and was even then told, well, you know, call my office when you have about three or four left, and then we'll call in uh, a prescription and get you some fresh ones. It, but I'm here now. The bottle says dispose of after a year, and now you're telling me they're good for like another six months, and then to call you when I'm down to three or four. Um, I, I believe that's one part of the the problem with um, the stigma of being a minority um, in need of uh, a pain management. And the pharmaceutical companies, um, when they were just running these mills of painkillers to boost their profits, and then created a pandemic of, what was it, Oxycontin? The Oxycontin uh, pandemic where people were getting hooked on that, um, treating whatever their ailment was. Um, that is a... Um, that is definitely a medication that um, I've always tried to stay away from. Um, the first time I, well, the first and only time I was ever prescribed Oxycontin was when 
Um, the pandemic related to that was getting to the point where people were starting to knock over um, pharmacies trying to get a hold of those pills. And I was like, well, if it's, if it's that bad, I don't know if I want to keep taking it. And, and like I said earlier, um, different types of pain medication affect people differently. And when I took it, it didn't do, it didn't take the edge off of my sickle cell episode at all. All it basically made me do is not care that I was having a sickle cell episode. So those pills, I, I took them back to the doctor's office as soon as that particular sickle cell episode crisis passed and was like, yeah, I don't, I don't want these, you know, I'm, you know, just prescribe me the, the, what's worked up to, up to that point, which was Vicodin, which they don't make anymore. It's called um, Norco, Norco now. Um, but, and that's generally what um, I use when I have a sickle cell episode at home uh, to deal with the pain management, that, and then just try to force myself to drink water um, because during a sickle cell crisis, that's basically what the hospital is going to do also. Um, keep me hydrated, um, help me manage my pain. And then if my hemoglobin count drops too low, um, then I have to have a blood transfusion. And blood transfusions can come with a whole different set of complications. So I usually try not to let it get that point. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So based on what you described of some of the policies, those are really great ones. I'm hoping that, you know, some state and federal, you know, or at least state legislators or their staffers uh, will see this um, recording and put that into effect or, you know, join um, advocacy organization, uh, you know, even those, um, as I know, sickle cell, Anemia organization to, you know, advocate for these type of you know, policy changes. So, uh, do do you think those ones that you describe is what most uh, people with um, sickle cell experience, like dealing with the doctors, and, you know, based on getting to know others who have um, similar conditions, one of the challenges that you see a lot of people are experiencing. Yeah, um, the just from talking to a handful of people that I've encountered that um, have dealt with uh, dealing with uh, managing sickle cell, um, it, it seems to be that that seems to be uh, their experiences also. Um, you know, trying to get um, you know treatment at the hospital and not basically having to prove that you're you're there because of a sickle cell crisis, you know, you're not there because you're um, opioid shopping, you know, um, and it's, uh, I, I've never met a person with sickle cell my age. Um, normally they've been um, younger than myself. Um, I've met quite a few people who have had others with sickle, other, members of their family with sickle cell that have relayed um, information in, in the experiences of their uh, family members um, but to me during conversation. Um, on, my, on my father's side of the family, um, there was apparently a cousin that um, had sickle cell also, and I think she passed away um, in her mid thirties. Um, so, uh, and that was my understanding that was a, a few years ago. So, um, and uh, my aunt on my father's side actually had told me about her and that she was in the hospital um, every other month, every few months. Um, and even, even she tried to make the best of her situation. She went on to my understanding, um, finished school, got a degree, um, so it's, it's, uh, but definitely my understanding is, oh, okay. So she was in her, yeah, in her early thirties, um, that my experiences are similar, 
um, to other people that have had sickle cell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see what you're see what you're saying. So, is there anything else? Well, before I get to the next question, um, I like you know how you talked about you beautifully illustrated you know what the experiences are you know living with the hidden disabilities so I just want to make a note that you know disability is you know on the spectrum is 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 um fluid it's like you know is a it, it consistent and disability is defined by the Americans with disability and right? it's anything that majorly um, affect um, aspect of a person's life. So that's hearing, thinking, seeing, feeling, mm -hmm. you know, anything that affects a major part of, you know, uh, of their life. And so, you know, so there's many people, um, you know, as you see today, who have, you know, um, in, you know, disabilities, and it does not make them, you know, less disabled or not disabled, you know, uh, disability isn't just people in wheelchairs and, and such, you know, it's, it affects one in four people. And um, I think in the black community, it's one in three. So um, it's, it's, it's us, it's me, it's you, it's your aunties, it's your cousins, it's so many things, it's mental illness, it's, uh, you know, physical, it's hidden, it's, you know, uh, many different things. So just want to make sure people can understand that. And it's nothing to be, you know, ashamed of. It's just, you know, part of life is something that we have to deal with, but uh, with more awareness and, you know, linking up and, you know, and discussing uh, and more media representation, we can most definitely, um, you know, begin to address this and, Become you know uh, better people because of it. So um, just so if anybody have questions, um, as I stated before, please put it in the comment section, and um, I'm going to uh, get to them in a few minutes. So the last couple of questions that I have for you, um, Herbert, is uh, what do you want more people to understand about sickle cells in particular that you think. Um, you know, the black community, or, you know, the public don't understand about sickle cell that you want them to know? Um, one, um, if you have, I would like people to, to know and understand that if, if you have um, sickle cell or any type of chronic illness, um, learn to advocate uh, for yourself. Um, the the medical professionals, they're people too. Sometimes they get it wrong. Uh, there's been several occasions in the hospital where I've had to disagree with a potential treatment that a doctor uh, was trying to administer. Um, if I'm conscious in the hospital, I always ask what's in that needle before they just come and inject it in, in, into my line or you know, what are, what are these pills or what are these prescriptions gonna do? Um, definitely be sure to advocate for yourself. Don't be afraid to ask questions. If you have a medical professional that's that's talking the, the medical ease, um, ask them to put it into layman's terms. Um, ultimately, it's your body. And I don't care how many uh, degrees a medical professional may have, um, nobody knows your body like you do. Um, it's like taking your, your car uh, to the mechanic and the mechanic says, oh, I can't find nothing wrong. Well, I'm driving the car every day and I'm telling you that it's, you know, pulling to the right. Well, we test drove it, and didn't see anything. And then two weeks later, you're back in there again for the same issue. Um, it's the same way, I think, with our health. Um, if, if you feel something's not right, um, speak up. If you don't, if you feel that your medical professional um, is not listening to you. Um, talk to someone else. Um, the last time I was in, or the two years ago when I was in the hospital <clears throat> for a sickle cell crisis, my fourth day in the hospital, I developed an intense pain on my uh, left side. And I kept telling the doctors that came in, you know, I've got this sharp shooting pain. Um, 
my left side of my stomach area was very tender to touch. And one doctor just flat out told me, well, we did a, we did a, I don't remember if it was an MRI or a CAT scan. We did a scan on you when you were admitted into the hospital. Well, that was three days ago. Um, it was actually, I kept advocating for myself. It was actually the staff nurse um, that worked my floor uh, during the day. Um, she was the one that actually um, convinced the doctor to run the test that was needed. And the first thing they did was a ultrasound. Ultrasound came back inconclusive, but then at that point, because it was inconclusive, they did a, a I don't know if it's a CAT scan or an MRI. They did a, a more sophisticated uh, diagnostic and then it come to find out that um, my spleen had been damaged during the sickle cell episode and part of my spleen tissue um, had died off and that was the pain that I was feeling. So uh, definitely uh, what I would say is, is whatever your condition, um, advocate for yourself. Um, there's nothing wrong with going to uh, Google or WebMD and typing in your symptoms um, if you're having issues or you're experiencing something new. Um, ultimately, like I said, it, it, it's your body. Um, it's your $50 million Lamborghini that you need to take care of and you need to advocate for. Um, the other thing I would say is, is uh, don't be afraid necessarily to um, talk about your condition with uh, those in your life. Um, now, I don't just bump into people and go, hey, what's up? I got sickle cell. Um, but the people that are that I am close to in my life, my friends, family, you know, they they know what the condition is. They know um, the challenges of, of dealing with it um, from conversations with them. So uh, definitely the only way to take away the stigma of um, dealing with a chronic condition and dealing with how uh, people with chronic illnesses are treated in the medical industry is to uh, bring the information forward and bring it into light. Because uh, the more people that hear it and know about it, um, the better chance we have of, of seeing positive changes um, to try and ease the burden of dealing with a chronic condition. Yeah, that's, that's great you know, advice for people you know, to, to know. Of that, and as far as it got ties into, you probably already answered it, but I'm just gonna ask it for the sake of asking. Um, and so this is my uh, last question. So if anybody have any uh, the questions, or you were, you know, this is the time uh, to ask. Um, so my last question to you, ever is like, what are some of the recommendations? or, you know, our advice on living a successful life, just period, you know, with uh, a chronic illness. You already got answered it, like I said, you know, say advocate for yourself, but is there any other uh, recommendations that you have to be successful living with it? Um, <coughs> uh, I, I think definitely one of the first things is, um, know what your limitations are. Um, having sickle cell, uh, some of my uh, crises have been brought upon me um, living beyond my limitations. Um, a sickle cell episode can flare up through um, stress, any type of stress, whether it be emotional, physical, um, getting the flu, getting a cold, anything like that, um, overexertion. Um, so I definitely think that in order to help you be successful uh, in your life or dealing with a, a chronic condition is one, recognize what your limitations are. Um, live your life within those, re within those uh, limitations. Um, doesn't mean that you can't hold down a job. Um, maybe you can't hold down a job where you're on your feet for eight, nine hours a day. Um, but maybe you can find a job in an area where you're sitting at a desk or 
you know, your um, bus driving or something. Um, definitely whatever the limit, whatever your physical or mental limitations are, um, the best thing to do is, is recognize what your limitations are and then seek out your, your professional and personal successes um, based around um, your defined limitations. Um, like I said, I've, I've been, I think I've been fortunate in that um, I've had jobs that have allowed me to work um, with my sickle cell. Um, when I was hospitalized in my mid to late 20s, um, the family doctor that I had at the time told me that I should apply for disability. Um, and and uh, to be perfectly honest, um, I was afraid of the stigma of being on disability. <coughs> so I didn't apply. Um, and I just tried to figure out a way to get my health back to the point where I could um, rejoin the workforce on a full-time basis. Um, so it's, there isn't, everybody's situation is going to be different. Everybody's response is going to be different. But um, I, I honestly do believe that there is a way for everybody um, for the majority of people with a disability to find some success in, in the workplace. I mean, one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us is that people can get the job done from home in front of a computer on the internet. Um, so maybe somebody that has anxiety that deals with mental illness, um, I definitely think that the ability to work remotely has um, hopefully opened up doors for some people that maybe that maybe struggled um, before the pandemic with reporting to a location um, every day or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so that's, I mean, that, that's definitely what I what I would recommend is, like I said, you know, live within your limitations. And I don't mean that in any type of, of negative way of you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, my, uh, I like to refer to things in vehicle terms a lot. You know, my truck that I drive can't do 200 miles an hour. Um, it's not a sports car. My body um, can't do some of the things that somebody without sickle cell uh, can do. And those are just things that I have to recognize and, you know, uh, take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves when I can, and then realize my limitations of my illness when I can't. So, but I, I definitely think everybody um, ha has the opportunity to find a light of doing um, something, you know, that you can possibly hopefully enjoy in the workplace or, um, if your if your job isn't one that you enjoy, um, have a hobby. You know, do to find something. Everybody has something um, that they enjoy doing or enjoy spending time with, and um, applying that to your disability or whatever it is that you're dealing with. Um, make the most out of the things that bring you joy in your life. Um, and whatever your affliction is, um, I definitely think that uh, some form of happiness makes uh, dealing with any condition um, a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. We all, I like to say, we all, you know, have a purpose and, you know, creative a reason. So, you know, just, you know, do what you um, can do. And I like, and um, what your passion is, but also like you say, you know, you have, uh, you know, work within the framework of limitation though, to exert yourself to try to prove, you know, say you're mm -hmm. like everybody else know, you know, do what you, you know, uh, can do, practice self-care, you know, find um, what you like to do with your happiness and that you're, you know, I think, you know, you say, same thing, you know, you're not, 
all just your disability. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're like, you, I mean, you're a father, you know, you have data analysis, you, you know what I'm saying, you're a husband, your friend, your brother, you many different things, you know. These are people just uh, you know, understand that we're, you know, it's just one aspect of our life, but, you know, we are many different different things. So thank you very much. Uh, so we do have a question. If anybody has any more questions, uh, please put it in uh, on the comment section on Facebook. But the question is, many times we talk about areas of disabilities and we don't talk about the gifts and successes of individuals with various disabilities. Can you briefly share with the listening audience some of your successes as a person with a health impairment? And what are some things that people may not know what you excel in? Can you share briefly? Um, <clears throat> yeah, when, uh, it, when I was in my 20s, I worked in the uh, retail field as a fraud investigator. Um, and I got to the point where I was really proficient at my job. Um, even dealing with a sickle cell, um, I would sometimes find myself having to um, run after uh, shoplifters or people that have committed uh, acts of retail fraud. Um, sometimes I was attacked in the, in the course of doing uh, my job um, and had to defend uh, myself and put handcuffs on people or whatnot. Um, but I was able to uh, carve out a name for myself within um, my employer at the time they had for my, my productivity, um, for reducing stock loss, uh, reducing fraud. Um, and that was something that even, and I spent some time, I would get sick, I would have sickle cell episodes, um, but, that was something that I feel was a success that I was able to, even though I have a chronic condition, um, was able to be considered a, a valuable employee by that particular employer at the time. Um, when I left that job and went to another position that um, similar work area, um, I'd say the, the two greatest successes there were um, one, uh, I continued to progress in my my profession at the time. Two, I met a woman that would, you know, in the future down the road be my wife. Um, and it's uh, it, it's definitely having a health impairment shouldn't be thought of as a death sentence. Um, it's it's definitely the the everybody, I, I believe that you you can find a path uh, to personal success in your life. Um, and everybody struggles different. Um, but I have to say those were probably my, my two greatest uh, successes is I met somebody that um, was able to become a partner in dealing with uh, my, my condition. Um, that we ended up having a family, expanding our family with, and that I've uh, been able to meet individuals in the workplace that weren't aware of what sickle cell anemia was. And when I explained the condition, um, it allowed them a better level of understanding that um, one, once again, it goes back to, well, you don't look like you're sick. Well, now you understand that there are many people out there that don't look like they're sick, but are dealing with, with a condition. So I definitely say, I would say the probably three greatest would be, um, you know, bringing awareness to people in your life that um, don't necessarily know what your condition is or, you know, um, and, and two, being able to um, work in my field of choice, even with the challenges of, of, of being ill at times. And then three, being able to uh, meet somebody and start a family that is supportive 
um, it, that is definitely supportive in, in dealing with a chronic illness. You know, I think that's definitely, um, definitely one of the ways to help you be successful is, is try to surround yourself with people um, that will advocate for you, that will um, be supportive of you, and even people that will challenge you in dealing with your illness. You know, um, there's been several occasions where my wife has put her foot in the crack of my behind because I wasn't uh, doing what I should be doing in order to take care of myself. So, um, yeah, that's that. That would be my my uh, my thoughts on that question. Yes, yes, yes. Great answer. So, uh, if there's not any more questions, I just like to again thank you. You know, Herbert Alexander for uh, speaking, you know, with me today uh, about, you know, your journey living with uh, sickle cell. You know, great, uh, you know, example. You beautifully illustrated, you know, what it's like. So, you know, I'm hoping that people, you know, will be, uh, you know, inspired uh, by, by your story, and motivated. And, even some challenges or some, uh, some, um, what you say, some policy changes, you know, by start people to think about that needs to happen. So thank you well, very thank, much. Thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, I hope whoever's watching is able to take away um, something um, that they can find beneficial or of use to themselves. So, um, yeah, thank you for reaching out. Um, and asking me to take part in this. Uh, it, it's It's been educational, so thank you. Yes. So uh, join me um, again in uh, July. Um, I guess the date is escaping me right now. But in July, so you can see um, MDRC's Facebook page uh, where I will be speaking with uh, Zakaya Mayberry um, on Let Me... <coughs> um, Lack and mental illness. I know July is uh, BIPOC, uh, Minority Mental Health Month. Um, so this a great uh, discussion. So thank you everyone for joining us. See everyone next month.